just uh, talking to Melissa. Melissa, we were saying how much we enjoy the sound of the rain. It's just so nice. That God gives us all these different types of weather to enjoy. And uh, all of it we need, right? Well, I shared with you a new hymn last week. And I loved it so much that I put it on this week too. So we're going to sing it again. This is called Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And I just love the words of it. We're going to slow it down a little bit so you catch the words. Let's stand and sing. It goes like this. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no
beautiful hymn. You may be seated. Well, good morning to everybody on this beautiful Lord's Day, right? It's a great day. Woke up today and we're fully saved and through faith in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. We're fully accepted in the beloved, right? Yes. Praise the Lord for that. So a lot of, a lot of things to uh, be thankful for and I think a lot of reasons to call this a beautiful Lord's Day. Full of His grace, full of His grace and hope, right? Well, it's good to see uh, each and every one of you. We wanted to, just to highlight a few things regarding opportunities for church, family, life, and ministry. Uh, please remember in your bulletins, um, and uh, make, make sure you have a bulletin today, but uh, Karen Outreach or our women's group will be collecting money for the pregnancy center uh, to aid in the cost of getting the ultrasound machine up and running. And our goal is $2,000. And uh, February the 25th is when we're going to uh, kind of call that quits on the offerings, and they're going to try to present that to them. Wouldn't it be great if we just went right past that, blew right past that like a, like a speed limit sign, right? Right, Jared? <laughs> what if we just blew right past that 2,000 mark for the glory of God and provided more money towards that uh, ultrasound? Uh, wouldn't be a waste, would it? So just, uh, just be thinking about that. Pray about how much the Lord would have you give for that. And you can put that in the offering plate and just designate it. Somehow make sure you designate it uh, for, the, for the pregnancy center. Also, I want to just put down uh, a little more clearly um, all the ways that the downstairs portion of the fellowship hall is being used and what days. Just to, so the church, everybody would be aware of it. So Mondays... Uh, of course, 7 o'clock on is AA group. Tuesdays in the morning is release time. Mondays and Thursdays in the morning is the lift exercise class. And then, of course, Sunday mornings are a regular Sunday school class. So there's a lot of groups, different groups that kind of use that facility down there. And uh, we're thankful that uh, it's really getting a nice facelift, by the way, if you haven't been downstairs recently. Uh, I encourage you to go down there. Well, you'll go down there maybe this afternoon because we're going to have a, a light in Bethlehem luncheon after the service. Um, so make sure you look at that, though, downstairs. But that's just some of the ways that throughout the week uh, the fellowship hall has been being used. And also today, again, after the service, we will have a luncheon for those that were involved in Light in Bethlehem. We want that to be kind of a debriefing time, a discussion time on what went well, what needs to be improved on, a um, variety of things like that. While it's, it's all kind of still fresh in my mind, in our minds. And um, I mean, you're, if you weren't a part of that, you're still welcome to come down and have some fiddles, I guess. We won't throw you out. We'll give you some leftovers. But uh, that's going to be immediately following uh, the service today. Um, and also put on your calendar, if you would, our next Embers meeting is going to be February the 12th. So if you do put that on your calendar today, uh, you're more likely going to be able to be there during that meeting time. All right? Good. Everybody glad to be amongst believers today? Good to see some of the church family again. Sam and Bev, nice to meet you guys. Welcome to Christy Free Church. Uh, their presence here means that they're more well than they were. And we're thankful for that. Been praying for them a lot. They've had a long, lot of ongoing. <laughs> Almost forgot how to get here. Uh, well, we're thankful that you guys are doing better and our prayers are being answered and uh, still a lot of more people that need prayer and we'll be remembering them later on in the service. I'd like to invite you to stand with us and we'll unite our hearts in prayer and then continue our time of worship together. Father, we come in rejoicing today, Lord. Your, your Holy Spirit has stirred our hearts with praise and joy today, and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for every reason that we have to lift our voices in praise to you, every reason that we have to sing these songs of worship and adoration from a first-person perspective, Lord, not just because somebody else put these words in our mouth, but, Lord, this communicates our heart and our testimony and our worship to you, Lord. 
So we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the for new hymns like this that express theologically, but yet emotionally and relationally, uh, what we experience as your children as we walk with you, Lord. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your faithfulness this week. Thank you for those that you sustained this week, Lord, and uh, those that uh, you worked in their hearts and worked in their lives, but also worked in their bodies, strengthening and purging a lot of illness out of their bodies, Lord. And thank you again that Bev and Sam are doing so much better. And we want to pray for others that aren't with us today, Lord. Strengthen and encourage them and their hearts. Uplift them in their faith and joy in Jesus. We'll thank you for that today, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.
The children can come forward now for the children's message. So guys, we have been missing the, the hippo family. You can go to the next screen. We've been missing the hippo family, have you? I've been kind of missing them. So I bet you they would love a little note or to hear from you and say, hey, we miss you. And we wish you'd come back. I know they've had some sickness and whatever. So be praying for them and maybe you write them a little note. That would really encourage them, I'm sure. Well, do you remember, you can go to the next screen, that we have been talking about becoming a friend of God. And there were two people that we've talked about so far in the Bible that God calls his friend. And the first one was, for 20 points, uh-oh, Abraham. It was Abraham. And the one we've been talking about for 20 points. Moses. 20 points for Poppy. Moses. Very good. Moses was called God's friend. We've been following his life and to see how he became a friend of God. And the last time we saw that he had gone up to the mountain, remember? And he'd received the, the commandments of God. And he was 80 years old, or somewhere around there at this time, and he went up and up, up and down and up and down and up and down this mountain an awful lot. Um, but in our story today, he's gone up and down and up and down and up and down, guess what? He goes up again. He goes up the mountain, and this time he spends 40 whole days with God. Can you imagine? Wow. God talked to Moses for 40 whole days. And he told him how to instruct the people of Israel to live so they could honor this wonderful holy God who had delivered them and who loved them. And how they could live as free people as following him. And I can only imagine how much Moses came to love God in those 40 days. Because boys and girls, you know what? The more time you spend with God, the more you will love him. 40 whole days talking to God. Wow. At the end of those 40 days, God gave Moses a very special gift. Exodus 31 says, He gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Mo Moses made his way down the mountain to tell the people the special messages from God. Can you imagine how excited he must have been? But God had told Moses while he was still on the top of the mountain that while Moses was gone to the mountain, that the people waiting down below had the ones that God had so lovingly and generously delivered and given his law to. And just a month and a half before Moses was just gone 40 days, right before that, they had promised to follow God. Guess what they had done? They had already turned to idols. Can you imagine how Moses must have felt? Ashamed. Surprised. He could hardly believe it. How could they turn on God that quickly? So God sent Moses down the mountain with that special gift, God's law, written by God's own finger. And the Bible says it this way. The tablets were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Wow. So when Moses arrived at the bottom of the mountain, he saw all that, all that God had told him was true. Instead of patiently waiting on the Lord, the one who had brought them out of Egypt, the one they had promised just 40 days before to serve no matter what, they had made a golden calf and a lifeless statue. They were worshiping it and dancing in front of it. And the Bible says that as soon as he came near the camp and he saw the calf and the dancing, go ahead to the next screen, that Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hand and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. Moses was angry. Why was he angry? He was angry because God, his friend, 
had been betrayed. The law was broken already, and the people of Israel had barely started. They betrayed the God they had promised to worship just a month and a half before, the one who had brought them out of Egypt, across the Red Sea. Let me tell you something. When you really become a close friend with God, you might feel angry sometimes, and that's normal. When God, your friend, is betrayed or spoken badly of, or his words are misused, you might get angry. It's what you do with that anger that matters, though. See, Moses, in the days following this event, would cause the people to go ahead and burn down that idol. He mixed the ashes with water and made them drink it. And then he went back up to the top of the mountain again, and he begged God to forgive the people and to give them another chance. You see, his love for his people brought him to pray to God for his mercy to be poured out. And on that mountain, Moses, this time, would carve out the Ten Commandments on stone and go back to lead the people in his righteous rules. You see, there is such a thing as righteous anger. And righteous anger always leads to reconciliation, to prayer, to love and to bringing people back to following God. In Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27, Paul writes this, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. You see, we learn from Moses that being a friend, from God, friend of God means that sometimes you're going to feel frustrated and even angry when God is mistreated by people. And it will hurt your heart and you might get really mad when people misuse his name or speak lies about him or say he said things that he didn't say. Because he's your friend. That is righteous anger. But what we need to be careful in how we respond. We must take that opportunity then to share about our great God and pray for those people as Moses did and to teach them and to lead them back to serving God. Be angry and do not sin. Another good lesson for all of us here. Uh, we'll go to praise time. Does anybody have anything to share this morning? It's hard to believe, but just 30 years ago, George and I were in Russia. And uh, we met a lady over there that was an English teacher, and the, uh, there had been a group from the Thomas and Glover before, and they were younger people. She wanted to wait till some more mature people came before she would really listen to what the young ones had to say. And through a course of time, we led this lady to the Lord. Her name was Raya. Then we just heard this week that Raya went home to be with the Lord, and the uh, Joel Graham has a church over there, and Mariah helped to build that church, and uh, many people loved her. She brought her friends to the Lord. Um, so it was just a, a joy to, re, to rethink over that time that we spent in Russia and the connections we had and, and see the fruit of people coming to know the Lord. Amen, yes. Thank you for Raya and for you guys to be over there to share the gospel with her. Anybody else have anything to share? I guess it's time for prayer then. I remembered one more thing. Uh, Olivia is pregnant for her second baby, her and Joe, so we're thankful for that. 
May you remember her in prayer. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord today. You know, when you miss a Sunday, I don't know how people stay out of church. When they have, I know, I think of you people that have had to be here for such a long time. I, I, I prayed for you hard because I thought, this has to be hard. I missed one Sunday and I thought like it was in eternity. We need the family of God. We need each other, don't we? And aren't you thankful that we have this opportunity to come together, share our needs, Pray together, trust God to work and to minister. God is so good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Lord, we thank you today. Our hearts are filled with praise for all of your bountiful blessings. You send the sunshine. You send the rain. You send the harvest, golden grain. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you bless us with day by day. Truly, we can say with the psalmist, daily, you load us with benefits. We thank you, Lord, that Sam and Bev are improving enough to be with us today. That's an answer to our prayers, and we thank you. Would you continue to minister to every need that's represented in their life? And Lord, we also pray for their daughter, too, that you would just continue to minister to her need and bring that healing touch in such a way that she will know without a shadow of a doubt that it's the Lord that has touched her and will thank you. We want to remember the Woodcock family that are dealing with a lot of illness at this time. And with the illness also, they're dealing with, with sorrow for the loss that they've dealt with. And we just pray that you would visit that home with your comfort today and your strength. Bring that healing touch too, Lord, and work in each life, we pray, from the youngest to the oldest. Minister to every need, and Lord, we'll just thank you, and we'll give you praise. We ask, O oh God, for our country. Our hearts are heavy when we think of the number of children, babies that have been murdered in our country legally. Oh God, it just breaks my heart to think about it. And yet, Lord, I pray that you would break through in our country. Oh God, we pray that you would move. We don't know heart, we confess sometimes, we don't know quite what to say or how to pray. But Lord, our hearts are heavy for America. If ever we need you, Lord, we need you now. Oh God, would you break through in our country? Would you break through, Lord, that there would be a time of repentance before the Lord, a time of coming down and weeping before the Lord for the failures that we have experienced in our country. And pray, Lord, that we would see a revival. Oh God, break through. Send a revival. Start it right here, we pray. Lord, we love to see you move in revival powers. Oh, Lord, we'll thank you. We want to remember the situation in the Ukraine and in Russia. There are many godly people there. Oh, Lord, we just pray that you would minister and you would work in a very special way. Protect your church, we pray, as they endeavor to worship. Oh, Lord, keep them safe. And, oh God, we pray that you would move and you would break through in this situation. We don't know, Lord, just how, but we know that you do. And we pray the same for Israel. Lord, that you would work in this situation. There are so many lives being lost. And, oh God, we pray that you'll work in such a way that this, you will cause these wars to cease and there will be peace once again in that area. Oh God, minister, work and move, and we'll thank you. Lord, we pray that you would continue to have your way in this service. In everything that we say, in everything we do today, we want it to bring honor and glory to your name. We pray, Lord, give us ears to hear what you have for us from your holy word today. Help us to take that word and to put it within our hearts 
and hide it there, Lord, that we not sin against you. Have your way in the remainder of this service, and Lord, we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. amazing how 
relevant something like a book of Judges can be for us today in the New, as New Testament believers in Christ. Judges chapter 16. I want to ask you today a couple of questions and don't anybody shout out the answers because this is intending to be a sort of a self-reflecting question. But how closely aligned have you been with the enemy this week? How much under the influence of the evil one have you allowed into your life this week? Are we aware of what the enemy knows about us and that he desires to ensnare, entrap, and ultimately lead us into sin to destroy us? Do we realize that? Do we realize that? Today we're looking at Samson again, and Samson with his affinity with the enemy. Samson and his affinity with the enemy. And our title today uh, is basically what the enemy knows. What the enemy knows about you, what he knows about me, should concern us. Because you can be sure whatever he knows about you, he wants to use against you. He wants to, to, to use against each of us. I want to start by reading this passage from the New Testament as you're turning to Luke 16. This is one of those before and after passages as Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And he says this, You were dead in the trespasses of your sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too, all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest were. But God, you were this way before, but God, being rich in his mercies, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in the trespasses of our sins, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised up with us, with him, and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not a result of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that formerly, you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by those who are of the circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, that's what you were, but now, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly afar off have been brought near by the blood of our Lord Jesus before and after. I think a lot of us need to hear a lot more of, but now. You used to be that way. You used to be that type of person. Why are you still living like that? But now what Christ has done in your life. But now think about the redemption that you have. But now think of what God has for your future. How God wants to use you. 
You were that away, <laughs> but you're not that away anymore. Praise the Lord. So we look at Samson today. Samson has an affinity with the enemy. Chapter 16 of Judges. Now Samson went to Gaza. We're going to stop right there. <coughs> Samson went to Gaza. Gaza for Samson is sort of like the story of the prodigal son. The far country where the prodigal son demands his inheritance from his dad and he takes his dad's money and goes to a far country. The idea is nobody will know me there. And I'll take dad's money and I'll, I'll live like I've always wanted to live. It's kind of what Gaza is for Samson. So he goes to, to, he goes to Gaza. You know, I was thinking about Samson and his situation in Gaza. You know, we live in a culture today that has done a good job <clears throat> at taking the sharpness and the offenses of sin and replacing it with tolerance, allowance, and permissiveness. So Samson needs a rest. I guess it's busy work, tiring work, frustrating work, being the deliverer of all of Israel, right? So he travels to Gaza. Now, a brief, a brief review here. If we recall, when God brought Israel out of Egypt and across the Jordan into the land of Canaan, it was still filled with pagans and enemies that were yet to be conquered. People who were enemies of God and enemies of God's people. There were idolaters galore. There were idols galore to be avoided. And there was a myriad of tests to face for God's people to face that would allow God to reveal their commitment or lack of it to him and to his word. A review, Judges chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel. He left them, that is, all of Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that those generations of people of Israel might know war to teach them who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines. No, just remember that phrase. These are the nations of the five lords of the Philistines. And all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Lebahaor as far as Lebo Hamath. They were there for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So Gaza, I did a little research on Gaza. You hear about the Gaza Strip all the time. I didn't know really what, how Gaza really fitted into all of that. But Gaza is an area along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea on the westernmost portion of Israel. It's believed to have been a town that was known for its many attractions, for any pleasures that a man's heart might desire. History tells us that it was a place where merchants and slaves and merchandise and people of all kinds could be found there. It was a convening place for people from the north traveling south and people who lived in the south traveling north could converge for business or pleasures of any kind with sizable sand dunes descending into the beautiful sea, surrounded by a very fertile plains with wells in abundance. It made for a very popular getaway place. It's described by some as a sort of New Orleans with an ever-ending Mardi Gras. So we see Samson's Heart. He's, he is developing an affinity towards the enemy. Samson is becoming addicted to his fleshly desires. There's no other way to put it. 
no softer way to put it. He is developing an addiction to the fleshly desires of his life. There seems to be sort of an incremental development here, sort of a, sort of a numbness, a growing numbness, which was, which was kind of making him more resilient to the conviction of sin in his own life. You ever been to a, a dentist and he, he gives you those shots, you know, and before, and immediately you think it's not doing much. And, and before, in a few minutes, you realize you can't control the spit coming out of your mouth. You know, it kind of gradually numbs your mouth. You think, well, this isn't doing anything. And then it starts, you start to sound like you're drunk because you're slurring your words, and then the drool kind of comes out. You look at me, you're looking at me, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You've all been there. But the numb is kind of, it doesn't happen like that, but it, is, it does kind of come on you. And so once the drill starts, you feel pretty confident then that that's, you know, it's not going to bother you. And it's like this, there's, there's a growing numbness of Samson to the, to, the, to the affinity, to the addictions of his fleshly life, his fleshly desires. And we see that growing and becoming more evident, especially as he goes to visit the land of Gaza. Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. Gaza was a stronghold of the Philistines, the enemies of God's people. So Samson is literally sleeping with the enemy. He's literally sleeping with the enemy. Addiction is something that we can't see with our eyes. And it's something that we always can't always be aware of in our own life. It's not something that we can readily say no to an addiction. An addiction is something that we almost always have to have somebody else to get us through it or over it. So the enemy knew Samson's weakness. The people of Gaza. Here was Samson. Can you imagine going, being Samson going to Gaza, the, the Mardi Gras of, of Israel? Hey, who are you? Oh, I'm Samson. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Israel. Uh, why is your hair so long? Oh, I'm, an, I'm a Nazarite devoted unto God. Are you religious? Yeah, I'm a Jew. What are you doing? I'm looking for prostitutes. I mean, how unconvicting does a person have to get when they get to that point? Not even, not, didn't wear a mask, you know? I mean, just there he was. So Samson went to Gaza, and there he met a prostitute and went into her. Verse 2, the, Ga the Gazites, the Gazaites, were Philistines. The Gazaites were told, Samson has come here and we're surrounding the place and we're going to set an ambush for him at night around the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night saying, let us wait until the morning and then we'll kill him. But Samson lay at night. So here the, the enemies know Samson. They, they know Samson's weakness. He likes the ladies. Amongst a thousand other things, his weakness is the ladies. So we're going to trap him. We're going to use his weakness against him. We want to destroy Samson. That's what the enemy wants to do with each one of us, by the way. What the enemy knows about you and me, we should, we should, we should be concerned about that. He knows your weaknesses. He knows my weaknesses. He knows how to just get right in there and stir up those, those, those temptations, those weaknesses. So he wants to do what Jesus said, steal, kill, and destroy all that God wants to bring life to. That's what the enemy wants. So they say, we'll keep quiet all night. We'll lay here until the morning, then we'll kill him. Verse 3, but Samson lay until midnight, and at midnight he rose up and took hold of the doors of the city, gates of the city, <coughs> and the two posts, and pulled them up, bar, uh, 
bars and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that's in front of the Hebron. Now, if you have a children's pictorial Bible, this is one of the pictures in that Bible of Samson with this big stone iron gate on his back. And if you ever wondered what was he doing with that, here it is. Here's that story. So he makes this very flamboyant exit once he's to escape his, uh, his perpetrators. But what we see here is that we see, we are seeing Samson sort of sink deeper and deeper into enemy territory. How dangerous it is to linger in enemy territory when we know as believers God wants us to come out of that. We know as believers that once the devil gets a hold of us, he wants to destroy us. He wants no good thing for us. And we know as believers, God doesn't want us in the enemy's territory. He doesn't want us kind of dabbling in the things that we used to, to dabble in. God says, you were like that. You did live like that. But now, but now you got no business doing that. <laughs> Samson had no business going to Gaza. But he was developing quite an affinity to the, for the enemy. So we see him going deeper and deeper into enemy territory. We see that the enemy was determined to bring ruin upon Samson's life. They knew his weaknesses and they planned to use that to capture him. So the Philistines, the enemies of God and his people, were left in the area of Canaan in order to test God's people and to teach them how to fight against the enemies. They were also there to teach Israel to prove whether or not they had hearts that were really willing to obey God and his word. So back in Judges chapter 3, verse 3, it's specifically mentioned that the enemies, the Philistines, were in the land and that there were five noble lords of the Philistines or princes of the Philistines. Probably each prince represented a dynasty, not just one person, but a length of warrior or a length of royalty or a length of rulers. But there, was, there were five of them. In Judges chapter 3, verse 31, it says it was... Shamgar, who delivered the, Israels, the Israelites from their enemies, the Philistines. Way back there, the enemies of God and his people were the Philistines. And then in chapter 10, verse 6, God's people took up the gods of the Philistines, their enemies, and God gave them over to the Philistines, the people whose gods they worshipped, until Jephthah, God raised up Jephthah, to deliver them out of the hands of their enemies, the Philistines. And then we get to chapter 13 again. And God raises up Samson to begin, to begin to deliver Israel from their enemies, the Philistines. And what does Samson do? He marries one. Earlier on, the last chapter, he married one. And now he chooses a prostitute. And if we look back to Joshua chapter 13, we read that the five lords of the Philistines ruled the domain of of Gaza. So Gaza just wasn't this place where there's a little bit of sin, there's a little bit of the enemy. This is where the five lords or the five leaders of the Philistines, they ruled from that. That was like the capital of the Philistines ruled. And that's where Samson went. Gaza was specifically not only a place of unbridled sin and fleshly pleasures, but it was an unconquered stronghold of God's enemies and the enemies of God's people. With that atmosphere, together with the fact that it was a stronghold of the enemy, one would wonder, why in the world would any self-respecting Israelite or Jew even travel there? Why in the world would any of us do the things we do and slip back into the practices that we do sometimes. We slip right back into enemy territory. And sometimes we think, well, God doesn't care. 
or I'm under the blood, you know, I can get by with it. I have people tell me, you know, I'm under the blood, so I, so what? It's almost blasphemy. Samson could have chosen any town, but he was influenced and drawn by his own sinful nature to that party area, that sin-filled area of Gaza, when he should have been fighting against and resisting the company and sinfulness that the enemy provided for him. I was reminded of Romans chapter 13 and verse 13. Romans 13, 13. Paul writes, and, and almost every time Paul writes, it's in correction. Almost every time he writes to the church, he's writing to let them know, you know, now, now you're all wrong about this. You're living in sin. This is what you need to do to make things right. So it's not like that doesn't ever happen to anybody. That's prevalent within the body of Christ. The issue is whether or not we're fighting against it. Romans 13, 13 says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling, not in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you listening? Make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. If it's snowing outside, if it's raining, what do you do? We'll make provision for it. We take an umbrella so it doesn't affect us. We take an overcoat and put on it. Because I'm going out there in the weather. It's so cold. That's making provision for the weather. Paul says, make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision to satisfy. Make no, make no option. Don't let it be an option. Don't make plans to allow that to be a part of your life. If you're an alcoholic, <laughs> stay away from the liquor store. Lust, stay away from the magazine rack at whatever drugstore you're going to. Gossip, learn to walk away when gossip is taking place. Gossip spreads like worse than poison ivy, you know that? You can just be near somebody with poison ivy, and if you're susceptible to it, you'll walk away and just kind of, even if you didn't touch that person, you're just like, oh, it's coming on me. And you may not think, well, I'm not a gossip, but you can go where, see, people are dramatizing and gossiping and slandering other people before it, and you know what? You're giving your two cents. Or you're taking what you just heard, and you're going over here, it sounds, it's so juicy, I'm just going to take it and spread it out to everybody else I, I talk to. That's something good to talk about. That's how gossip, that's how gossip works. We make provision. We, we allow it to come in. We allow it to come into our heart and life. So do not take, make any provision. Don't feed the flesh. If your flesh is hungry, don't feed it. Don't feed it with the things that's going to destroy your spiritual life. Don't go sleeping with the enemy like Samson did. Don't live your life in enemy territory, dabbling right on the edge. How far can I go? How close can I get without really becoming a reprobate? For us today, perhaps there have been times when, like Samson, we visit those areas of personal temptation, kind of like Samson visited Gaza. We dabble in areas of fleshly desires and interests that the enemy intends to use to bring us ruin. If we can feel compelled to be involved in some of those things, then we need to, we need to take steps to not allow those things to take hold of our hearts and lives. The enemy knows what our weaknesses are. To not allow our weaknesses to be addressed or to not address our weaknesses before God is a bad idea. These are just some thoughts that came to my mind this week. Dedicate your heart and mind and eyes to whatever your weakness is. If 
For your weakness is gossip. <coughs> then go to God and confess the sin of gossip and say, God, I'm, 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 I'm dedicating this, my mouth, my tongue, I'm dedicating this to you, Lord. I don't want any, I don't want this to become defiled by what I'm speaking, gossip and slander and things to other people. So, Lord, I'm dedicating my mouth to you. Lord, don't let me speak anything other than wholesome, God-honoring things out of my mouth. Some of us would go silent for a while, maybe. But we've got to start somewhere, right? If we're struggling with some of these things, we've got to start somewhere and, and put these things to death. Dedicate your heart, mind, eyes, mouth, lips, tongue, hands, whatever, whatever is your area of weakness, dedicate that to God as, a, as, a, as, as holy. Lord, take, take this, take this, purify this part of my life, this part of my body, this part of my activity. Dedicate your heart to that. Dedicate that to God. And then pray that God would give you an awareness or a consciousness of your own propensity to fall into sin, whatever it is. I, I don't, God forgive me if I'm slandering, but I don't think Samson, I think his conscience, it reminds me of someone with a seared conscience. The Bible speaks of that. It was seared or it was calloused. He didn't seem to have one. The Spirit of God would whoosh upon him, would, would, would come upon him, rush upon him. It didn't seem to affect his spiritual life. It affected his physical abilities, but it didn't seem to, the, the, the coming into the Holy Spirit, the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit just didn't seem to do much for him spiritually. But when we get calloused or accustomed to our weaknesses, accustomed to our sinfulness, before long that 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 tender Conviction of the Holy Spirit has a, has a little more callous stuff to go through to get to, to the heart that the Holy Spirit wants to get to or to our conscience that the Holy Spirit wants to get to. So pray that God would give you an awareness or a consciousness of your own propensity to covet or to embellish or exaggerate or brag or lie or whatever. You know covet? Covet? I don't think pe most people think covet is, is a sin. We can't even come up with that when we're doing the Ten Commandments. What was the last one? I don't know. I can't remember. We always leave covet out. Covet is basically un, un, unbridled lust for anything. You, you're coveting what somebody else has. You don't, you don't have it. So you lust towards that. You can't control that. All you can think of is that thing that you don't have, but they do. That's what covetousness is. It turns to an idol. If I only had that, my life would be better. But that's the one thing that seems like we can never we can never remember. But pray that God would would take these things and purify these parts of our lives or our spiritual life, and ask God to change you from the inside out because He wants that's what He wants to do. So our enemy knows our weaknesses and he is relentless. The enemy knew how to tempt Adam and Eve, right? All he had to do is get them to doubt God's word. The enemy knew how to tempt Job. The enemy knew how to tempt our Lord Jesus. Thank God he remained sinless, right? Our enemy knows how to tempt us. And sometimes, it seems, the enemy doesn't have to work very hard at doing it. As long as he knows our weaknesses, all he has to do is kind of stir that up a little bit. And our own sinful nature and desires sort of takes over. Because it's still in us. Our enemy knows our weaknesses and is relentless. And the enemy uses Delilah. The enemy uses Delilah. Didn't Tom Jones have a song about that? Anybody remember that song? Don't sing it. I remember the song Delilah. Verse 4, Judges 16. After this, after this other rambunctious <coughs> lifestyle of Samson, after this he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines, these were the people in Gaza that he was just chumming around with, 
And the lords of the Philistines came to her and said, Seduce him and see where his great strength lies. See, the, weak, the enemy knew just how to capture Samson, his lust. Seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we might overpower him, that we might bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. You know, Samson was a bit arrogant. Pride has a way of making people too confident and too careless. Lust clouds away, it clouds a man's thoughts and emotions and judgment in every way. So Samson loved Delilah, and the enemy knew his weakness. And Delilah became the face and tool of the enemy to bring ruin to Samson, or to attempt to bring ruin to Samson. They paid her to find Samson's weakness so that they could capture him and destroy him. That's what the enemy wants to do to, to Samson. That's what the enemy wants to do to each of us. 1 Peter chapter 5 says this. Be sober minded. Be watchful. For your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in the faith. Knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. How confident and careless Samson was towards the enemy. Well, they can't touch me. I'm a Nazarite. They can't touch me. I have long hair. I have superhuman strength. So three times Delilah attempted to get Samson to tell her where her strength lies. Three times he lied Three times she tried. Three times she cried. I just realized just before we came up here that that rhymed. Three times he lied. Three times she tried. Three times then she cried. Oh, Samson, you know you don't love me, Samson. You're not telling me the truth. The fourth time he told her. So Samson was evidently missing something up here. That's all I can say. After going through all of that, He knew something was going on. So the Samson told her that he was a Nazarite. He had never cut his hair. If you cut my hair, I will also become, I will also grow weak like any other man. So while he slept, his head was shaved. His hair was gone, and so was his strength. Delilah called for the lords of the Philistines, and they rushed in, gouged out his eyes, and bound him with shackles. Bound him with shackles. When the Philistines rushed in on Samson, he thought he'd just shake it off like he always did. But the Bible says something very, very concerning for each of us. Because in verse 20, he gets up, tries to shake off the Philistines and realizes his hair is cut, his strength is gone, and they got him. And the Bible says this. Samson did not know that the Lord had left him. He did not know that the Lord had left him. If he didn't know the Lord had left him, perhaps we might wonder if he ever knew the Lord was with him. Maybe he did think it was always his hair. I was thinking about that. Maybe he just thought it was his hair. It was just his hair. It wasn't the Spirit of God swooshing in on him, rushing in on him, over, you know, overtaking him. It wasn't God's answering a prayer. It wasn't God keeping his covenant with his people. It was just his hair. He was just doing a mighty, mighty good job at beating people up and massacring people. One commentary puts it this way. Here we see what a degree of folly and presumptuous presumption sin reduces a man's mind to. That was a that was a 16th century way of saying Samson has lost his blooming mind. Here we see to what degree and folly and, and presumption sin reduces a man's mind to. What madness, 
What presumption, therefore, was it to tempt God, but Christian, mark, as you mark the instance of Samson, learn not to be high-minded, but fear. What an easy prey is a man with all his boasted strength to any and every temptation when the Lord, for one moment, has withdrawn his support. So the Lord has withdrawn his support and now Samson, maybe for the first time in his life, realizes how utterly dependent he has been and now is without God. Samson only had the spirit of David. David writes this in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Well, Samson only had that attitude. He probably wouldn't be in the shape he's in. The Lord is the strength of my life. So as we conclude, we all have weaknesses. We all have weaknesses that the enemy is aware of and wants to use against us to steal, kill, and destroy, to bring utter ruin to any of God's people. We are all in need of biblical truth to guide us and correct us when we need it. For us today, remember these things. The Lord spoke to Cain in Genesis chapter 4. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and it desires to have you. That's a good illustration, a good description of each one of us. Sin is crouching at our door and desires to have us. But you must rule over it. So Christian, are you aware that the enemy, the devil, desires to have you and desires to destroy you? The Lord spoke to Cain. Jesus also spoke to Peter in Luke chapter 22. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Do we realize that Satan desires, and his purpose is to have us, to destroy us? Peter warned the church, be sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, is looking to devour you. It's interesting when we think about this warning from Peter. Jesus warned Peter, Satan desires to have you. Then later on, Peter speaks to the church, Satan desires to have you. Believe me. I know. I'm speaking from firsthand experience, church. I'm speaking on behalf of Peter here. Firsthand experience. The devil wants to have you, he wants to destroy you. In each of these cases that I just mentioned, God provided a way out. Cain, there was a way out. But you must rule over it. There was a way out. Peter, for Peter there was a way out. Jesus said, I have prayed for you. For the church, from Peter there is a way out. Resist him firm in the faith. Resist him firm in the faith. I would encourage you, if you're not, to start at point number one. If you want to end dabbling in the territory of the devil, if you want to put an end to his using your weaknesses against you, maybe you are a believer in Jesus, maybe you are not. But that's the first place we have to start. By trusting fully in Jesus as God's only Son, our only Savior, and in the matter of sin, our only Deliverer, the only one that can free us from the bondage of our sin. Trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Secondly, confess all your sins to God. Don't let any sin or any conviction of sin be squelched. Don't think, well, it wasn't that big. It was a white lie. Whoever came up with that, you know, gave us a great excuse to get by with sin. It's just a white lie. It's a lie, no matter what color it is. 
but confess our sins fully to God and ask him for help. God, help me to turn away from that, Lord. Purify that part of my life that's, that's so susceptible to temptation and falling into sin. Confess that as sin and ask God and repent and ask God to give you the strength and he'll do it. He will do it. He'll give you the strength to fight against it. But thirdly, the key is to fight. Even Paul said, I have fought the good fight of faith. He, he acknowledges that it's not a stroll in the park. And if you're not fighting against some sin, there's something wrong with your spiritual life. That's what I believe. Because if, our, if we're going on day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, and not struggling against some sin, you're either not here, you're in heaven, and we just think we're looking at you, or sin already has a foothold in your life. Fight the good fight of faith. And the best way to do that is with other believers. Find other believers that you trust. Not every believer can you trust. <laughs> with, your, with your sins and with your struggles. I wouldn't say just stand up and let us all know what it is. But with the body of Christ, find someone else and, and help. ask somebody, I need help walking through this. I need help fighting the good fight of faith. I'm trying to fight, but I still feel like I'm, the devil's kicking my teeth in. And look for some other people in the body of Christ that can walk with you. Holy Father, we come to you in Jesus' name today. Lord, we want to be free of the devil's power in our life. Lord, we want to be free of whatever things that keep us held in the devil's grip, whatever, whatever foothold, whatever stronghold that he might have, Lord, we want to be free of that. Lord, we want to be not just free of him, but full of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we surrender to the fullness and the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, if... If there's, not a, if there's someone who's struggling but not a believer, Lord, please draw their heart to full faith and trust in Jesus today. But if it is a believer, Lord, I just pray that you would open our hearts, each of us, Lord, to, to experience a fresh new power and victory of you at work in our life. A fresh purification of all the things that have held us uh, somewhat captive in the past things that continue to recur. Lord, help us to fight the good fight in the power of your Holy Spirit. And we'll trust you for all of these things, Lord. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask the uh, elders to come forward. We're going to uh, partake of the Lord's table this morning. Uh, speaking of being set free from the evil one, uh, this is all about what Jesus did, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's <coughs> Table. Remembering who we were, what we did, how we used to live, and now the life that we have in Jesus Christ. So I want to read just briefly from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I have delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I'd like to invite you just one moment if, to just bow your heads and close your eyes a moment. If you, if you didn't earlier, Lord, I, I just want to ask you to look to the Lord right now. And are you a true believer in Jesus? If so, 
take, we're, we'll, be, we'll be taking this bread and cup, remembering all that he has done for us. If you are a believer, if there's any sin in your heart or life, any um, that, that you're aware of, anything's ongoing, unconquered, please confess that to the Lord Jesus right now. Please confess it to him and ask for full victory, nothing but full victory. Lord, we want to be made right, and we want, to, uh, we want you to be Lord of our hearts and lives. We want to be pure, and Lord, we don't want to presumptuously take the Lord's Supper in a, in a flippant manner. Lord, we're reminded of who we used to be, and we don't want to go very far down that memory lane, but Lord, we're reminded of how we used to live, the things we used to do, the type of person we used to be until... You got a hold of our hearts and lives and your spirit started moving in, in mighty ways, Lord. Today we want to remember that. We're remembering what the sacrifice and shed blood of Jesus has accomplished for us. Oh God, how thankful we are for what this represents today. Your name, your name we pray thankfully. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. And Lord Jesus, we remember what we were and who we are now. And we thank you.
the end of the Passover meal, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood and the new covenant, covenant shed for you. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. Thank you for your shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord Jesus. Well, instead, let's walk closer to the Lord. And when we're weak, he is strong, right? Let's stand and sing.